Hello everybody, welcome to our meeting tonight and thank you for tuning in for this very important part of our program this evening. As we all know that today the world is full of chaos and problems and crisis that we are facing today. So we find ourselves in a time of chaos. And so we are here tonight trying to find answers. Now the theme of the sermon tonight is entitled, Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? May I read to you a passage from the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. Acts chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. I shall be reading to you from the New King James Version. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you in heaven, will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Tonight, we will try to find answers following questions. During this series of meetings, who is Jesus? Tonight, we will try to why he is coming back. Are you ready? So I ask you that as you listen, if you have some questions and our prayer requests, please write them in the chat box on your screen. And if you are participating via Facebook, please write your questions or your prayer requests in the comment section. And at the end of the sermon, there will be a free book offered, so please stay tuned until the sermon is over. Now, before we start the presentation of our speaker, may I invite you to close your eyes to pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful and we are so thankful to come before you tonight once again to know more about Jesus, to know more about his love, his grace, his companionship, and his, and his love towards us, especially that we are not worthy to receive you. But thank you for your blood at the cross, the blood that cleanses us and making us worthy to receive you and to be part of your generation, which you called us. We belong to a real priesthood. And so we are special in your presence. And so tonight we are inviting your spirit, your Holy Spirit, to be in our midst as we study and as we listen your words through the speaker. Thank you so much, O oh God, for being with us. Thank you for this privilege of coming together to know more about Jesus. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Amen. Our, our speaker is a father, a man of God, and a pastor. He's working as a district pastor in Rochester, New York. Our speaker tonight, Pastor Reynolds Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Elder Derek. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me again. It is my privilege to be with you. And I say good evening to the saints of the Lord and also good evening to all the sinners. Yes, because we are all here and the Lord has given us that privilege and as Paul says, of all the sinners, I am the first, but I trust in the Lord. Thank you for having me once again, hoping that you're having a great Sunday so far, and thanking God for the great honor to be connected through Zoom and Facebook as we have come together to explore the Word of God. There was a new pastor in a new, in a new district. He was moved to this new district that had so many churches. He had several churches in the city, but there was also a church in the countryside. The pastor was given the key to each and every church that first day he was introduced to the district. He saved every key. He knew every address of every church he was pastoring. He decided to spend the first two months 
of his tenure in that district in the churches that were in the city, close, closer to his house or closer to his home. However, when the time came, he decided to go to that church in the countryside. He was told that it was a big church, a big building. So the pastor starting on Sunday, he started preparing his best sermon because he was going to a new church. So all through the week, he dedicated time to prepare that wonderful sermon he wanted to preach in that church in the countryside. The story tells that the pastor woke up very early that Sabbath morning and he drove for two hours until he got to that little town where the little church or the church was. When he got there around 9.30 or 10 in the morning, he was in shock because the doors to the church were closed. But since he had the keys, he opened the church and went in. He went all the way to the back to the pastor's office. He stayed there. He was praying. He was meditating on that sermon that took him all week long to prepare. One of his best sermons ever. After an hour and a half of waiting, the pastor did not hear a word, did not hear anyone talking in the church or any program starting. So he got a little worried, but he was also asking himself, what is going on? This is such a huge building and I'm surprised that it's almost 11 in the morning and no one is speaking and I don't hear singing. I don't hear an amen. I cannot hear a thing. The pastor decided to step out of the pastor's office and get into the sanctuary. When he got there, he realized that inside that huge building, there was a huge crowd of two people. There were just two people sitting down in the entire church. There was an elderly man above the age of 80, and there was a little kid between seven and nine years old. When the pastor saw that huge multitude of two people, he said to himself, did I really prepare this wonderful sermon to preach it to two people? This can't be. So in his mind, he planned to do the following. He said, I am going to speak to them for five minutes, just five minutes. I'm going to say some simple words. I'm going to pray and I'm going to send them home. So he got up, he introduced himself as a new pastor. He spoke for five minutes, he prayed, and then he went to the front door to salute or to say hi to the new members of the church or that huge crowd that he had of two people. First came the elderly man. He walked by, the pastor said hi. They spoke for a minute or two. But the man was not very, very talkative, so he continued to walk. Then came the little kid. And the pastor, trying to be very transparent with him and, and trying to get him into a conversation, because he was surprised that he had come to church all by himself, he said, tell me your name. And the little kid said his name. And then the pastor said, what do you think about the words I just pronounced here today? What, what do you think about my words today? And the little kid said, wonderful words, pastor. But let me tell you something. The pastor leaned forward, got to the level of the little kid, and the little boy said the following words. My father is a cowboy. And my father has a lot of cows. And every day, Regardless if one cow comes by or 50 cows come by, he always makes sure he has enough food to feed the cows. The pastor understood the message. So he said, this kid is right. I need to feed them. It doesn't matter if 50 came or if two came, I need to give them the word of God. So he called the old man to come back into the church. Then he entered the kid back back into the sanctuary as well, and he preached his sermon for two hours. Two hours. And I'm not going to ask how many of you are willing to listen to me for two hours because I'm not ready to preach for two hours tonight. But the pastor preached for two hours. That sermon was an hour for each one of them. 
At the end of the two hours, the pastor once again stood at the front door. First, once more, came the elderly man. He passed by, didn't say a word, and left. Then came the little boy. The pastor once again, trying to be talkative with him, said, hey, what do you think about my sermon now? And the kid said, excellent sermon, pastor. But let me tell you something. Once again, the pastor got closer to him and the little kid said, my father is a cowboy. And my father, if one cow comes or 50 cows come, he always makes sure he never overfeeds the cows. So tonight my plan is not to overfeed the sheep of the Lord that are here connected tonight, but that we will go into the word of God and see what he has for us. No, I'm not going to speak for two hours, but I want you to pay attention to what the Lord wants us to hear this evening. And in order to do that, I would like to have a word of prayer, hoping that the Lord will lead us through tonight. Father in heaven, as we are about to open your word, I ask for wisdom, but I also ask for forgiveness. Lord, use me tonight according to your will and power, and according to your grace, prepare the hearts of those that are in need of hearing this word. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will use my tone of voice, my personality, and I'm grateful for that, but I pray that it will be your words and not mine. Please, Lord, manifest yourself and let us know what you want us to know tonight as we pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. If you have your Bible with you, I'm inviting you to open it up. If you do not have the Bible with you, I'm inviting you to find one. That's perhaps your home. And if you have it, as I typically say, on your iPhone, your iPad, your iPod, your Samsung, Blackberry, Blueberry, Raspberry, or Strawberry, because I don't know what type of phone you have, if you have the Bible app, you can open it as long as you are not going to close Zoom or Facebook. And I'm inviting you now to go with me to Revelation, the 20th chapter. We're going to go to the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, and we'll read from verse 11. Last book of the Bible. This is the last book. Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13 now. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I have decided to use for a subject today, under the general theme, Jesus is coming, are you ready? I have decided to use for a subject today, what is he doing? What is he doing? And I'm referring to he talking about Jesus, because last week we explored the question, who is Jesus? So connecting that to what we studied last week, that's why I've decided to use for a subject this evening, what is he doing? What is Jesus doing? First of all, in this description and narrative of the book of Revelation, we see that John is describing something that it appears to be terrifying. As a matter of fact, if you have a Bible with subtitles, you see that the subtitle for this section that we just read is the Great White Throne Judgment. And it's describing a judgment that I don't think that even Dante can describe. 
This is a judgment and a scene that is so terrifying that according to the first verse of it, the moon and the stars and the sun are fleeing away from it because they don't want to be part of it. It's talking about judgment. It's a terrifying judgment. And this section of scripture by so many people causes them to fear and to tremble because he's talking about a judgment that is so terrifying that no one wants to appear before the one that is opening the book. And according to verse 12, God was the one sitting and everyone was standing in front of him. I remember when I was a student pastor several years ago, I was doing my pastoral practice in a church and I remember this lady coming to me saying, Pastor, you need to speak about the judgment. Because when you speak about the judgment, people believe, people cry, and people repent. And I asked her a question. I asked her, why do you think that is? And she replied by saying, because people get scared and they don't want to get lost and be lost. So that's why they don't want to hear about the judgment because it's scary to them. Tonight, I want to tell you as an introduction that if you are here tonight because of fear, I hope that by listening to this message tonight, you would know and you will know that we're supposed to get closer to God, not out of fear, but out of love. If I were to ask you tonight, why is it that you want the blood of Christ to cover you? What would you answer? Would you say to me, oh, because I don't want to be lost? Or would you say to me, because I love the Lord so much that I want to be saved? There's a huge difference between obeying God because you don't want to be lost and obeying God out of love. There's so many times that we don't do things in life because we are scared of people finding out. And we do not stop doing them because we love the other person, but because we are scared of the consequences. I'm here to tell you tonight that this judgment that we just read about is a scary judgment, but it is not the only judgment in the Bible. This judgment is scary because he's talking about people that have no hope. And this happens a thousand years after the Lord comes to rescue his people. This is a second judgment. And as you read the narrative of verses 11 to 15, you find out that they're talking about a judgment for those that didn't make it to heaven. This is a judgment for those that remained lost, that didn't accept Christ. This judgment takes place after the millennium in heaven. And now there are so many people that are brought back to life in order for them to see why is it that they remained lost. And it describes that two books were opened. First, the book of their works and also the book of life. And it says that whoever that was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So the important thing is to be on that book, the book of life. And you may be asking tonight, how can I get into the book of life? That's what we want to find out. And it's connected to our subject of the day. What is he doing? But being before someone for judgment is terrifying. It's scary. Especially when it has to do with an eternal judgment. On September 19th, 1990, a man by the name of Julio Gonzalez was found guilty and condemned to 176 accounts 
and was charged to 25 years to life in prison for each one of these accounts. Imagine that, 176 accounts and he was charged or found guilty for each one of them and condemned to 25 years to life for each one of them. There was no way for Julio Gonzalez to pay these sentences that he had received from the judge. Imagine that, 176 accounts. And for each one of them, he was condemned to, from 25 years to life in prison. What did Julio Gonzalez did, you may ask? One thing is for, for sure, whatever he did was so big that today, 30 years later, is still terrifying. Have you ever thought about 176 accounts against you? This means that you stood judgment, but you knew that you were going to be condemned. You knew that you deserved it. And that was the case with Julio Gonzalez. He knew that before the judge and the jury, he was going to be found guilty. There was no escape for him. He needed 176 lifespans in order to pay for what he was being condemned for. There was no way he could pay for the penalty of his actions. What did Julio Gonzalez do? Once again, you may ask. A few months before, on March 25th, 1990, Gonzalez, looking for revenge, decided to burn the club where his girlfriend used to work. It was called Happy Land. That night, after an argument in the club, Gonzalez went to a nearby gas station and bought a gallon of gas, a gallon of gas, decided to go back to the club, ignite a fire at the lower level of the staircase that represented the only entrance to the club, which was located on the second floor of the building. With no other exit or emergency exit located in the upper floor, 86 people who were in the club that night died. That day, Southern Boulevard in the Bronx was the place of, at that time, what was considered the worst individual massacre in the history of this country. Gonzalez was condemned to 86 accounts of violent murder, plus 86 accounts of premeditated murder and two accounts of arson, totaling 176 accounts. He decided to act on his own and he had to pay 176 counts of murder and life in prison. It was impossible for him to pay that in one lifetime. Gonzalez died in 2016 at the age of 61 in the New York State prison system, all because he decided to act on his own. He looked for his own defense. He didn't accept the defense that was offered. And that's why he stood before the judge condemned. You may be thinking now, how can someone escape so many charges and so many life sentences. There's no way, there was no possible way for Julio Gonzalez to do that. I have to tell you tonight that in the spiritual life, it's the same thing with you and I. We have been condemned because of our actions to penalties that we are not capable of paying in so many lifetimes, just as Julio Gonzalez, Hence why we need somebody to take our place. The only person that can do that is Christ because of his perfect sacrifice and his eternal life. Unlike Julio Gonzalez, you don't have to appear before this throne of the great white, uh, before this judgment on the great white throne or before the great white throne. Because this judgment right here that Revelation describes is the judgment for those that decided to stand on their own without a lawyer in their judgment. 
There are so many people nowadays that they decide to, to go through trials, to go through a, a judgment on their own. They become their own lawyers. In the spiritual life, I must tell you this evening that we have way much more than 176 accounts against us before the throne of God. In Bible prophecy, and in regards to the sanctuary, you must know that the word throne has a significance. It's not just a throne where the king sits. It's a throne or, or sits. It's a throne where judgment takes place. When you hear about thrones in Revelation or Daniel, and specifically also in the book of Hebrews, it's talking about judgment. I have to tell you tonight that there is another judgment taking place. But that judgment is not a judgment as the one described in Revelation 20. Because the judgment in Revelation 20 is a judgment of condemnation for those that decided to stand judgment without a lawyer. However, tonight, I must tell you that unlike Julio Gonzalez, there is someone that has taken, taken our place, but if we reject him, then we will have to face this judgment. There is a judgment taking place right now. But we have someone that is willing to defend you. And he's offering you his services. And he's telling you, I can be your lawyer. And the amazing thing is that this lawyer is a perfect lawyer. He's not going to play with your case. And if you want to know more about that lawyer, I'm inviting you now to turn to the left of your Bible and go a few books back. There are tiny books in, in the middle of these two books that I'm mentioning, Revelation and Hebrews. And if you can turn with me to the book of Hebrews, you will see who is this person I'm referring to. The book of Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews will go to the seventh chapter, Hebrews chapter seven. And we'll read from verse 22. If you turn to your left in your Bible, you pass through some small letters, and then you get to the letter to the Hebrews. Chapter 7 from verse 22. It says, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Verse 24 says, but he, referring to Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's also able, listen to this part, to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And I want you to grasp that. There is a judgment going on right now. The day of atonement in our spiritual lives is going on because Christ is about to come. And the question I have for you is, are you ready for when he comes? Because when he comes, he's going to look for people that accepted his high priesthood. People that accepted his defense. People that accepted him as their attorney. It's saying here that he's willing to make intercession for you and I. He's willing not only to be your lawyer, but he's also willing to take your place. What a better judgment than this one, that the judge is also your lawyer. I don't know how many of you like to go to court being condemned. I don't know how many of you have faced a traffic a uh, violation and you have to face a judge or any other case, but it is scary to face a judge and to face a jury. And tonight I'm telling you in the spiritual judgment where you owe more than that man I told you about, Julio Gonzalez, way more than 176 accounts are written in the book against you. The Lord is telling you tonight, this judgment 
is not like the judgment of Revelation 20. The judgment of Revelation 20 is a judgment of sorrow, pain, and tears. But the judgment that is going on right now is a judgment, mark this word, is a judgment of hope. It's a judgment that is being done on your behalf. Because the good Lord says, I will take your place in the judgment. I will not only defend you, I will take your place. And if we continue to read here, it says in verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, listen to this part, who is holy, blameless, harmless, undefiled, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Verse 28 adds, For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. What is Jesus doing now? Jesus is taking your place in the judgment. What is Jesus doing now? Jesus is ready to defend you, but he's doing something else. Let's turn to the next chapter. And I want you to see this from the Bible. I don't want you to listen just to my words. I want you to read it for yourself. Hebrews, the eighth chapter now, right there, we continue to read from verse one. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And I say, hallelujah for this. If you're not getting it, I would like for you to grasp it at this moment. But before we can do that, I want you to write if it's possible or to say to somebody sitting with you or just to shout it in the room where you are. This will get interesting now. The Bible just said, that when Jesus Christ went to heaven, he did not only go to take your place, he also went to sit with the Father on his throne. And this is confirmed also in the book of Revelation, and we're not going to go there. Verse 1, Hebrews 8, it's saying that he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. He's sitting with the Father. I told you that according to Bible scripture, when you find the word thrones in regards to the sanctuary or prophecy, it's talking about judgment. And what this is saying is so beautiful and it brings hope to my life because what this is saying is that Jesus Christ is not only taking your place, but he's sitting with his father on his throne, meaning that he's sitting at the right hand of the father. In Exodus and Leviticus, when you read about the right hand of the Father, he's talking about the just God of the, the just hand of the Father, the righteous hand of the Father. The hand, the right hand of the Father signifies justice, perfect justice as a judge. And tonight I'm telling you that Christ, your God, is sitting at the right hand, in the sight of justice of the Father, judging you. So once again, let's find ourselves in everything that is happening here. In this judgment that is taking place right now, the judge is also the one who takes your place. How can you lose that case? If the one who's saying, no, I'm taking his place is also the one who's going to pronounce the sentence, there's nothing to lose. Because Christ said that he came to save and seek the lost. He came to save those that were lost. Oh, I'm telling you this evening that my king is telling you tonight, it does not matter if you have 176 sins that you have not confessed. Tonight, if you confess them, tonight, if you come to the Lord, tonight, if you come to Christ, 
He tells you, I will defend you, but I'll be also the judge. I'll also be the judge, meaning how can I condemn myself? How can Christ condemn himself? He's ready to offer you hope tonight. You don't have to stand alone like Julio Gonzalez 30 years ago. Tonight, I'm telling you through the scriptures that in this judgment that is taking place right now, everything has been set up to give you freedom, to give you salvation, to give you hope, and to give you redemption. The right hand of the Father wants to declare you righteous in the judgment. He's not asking you, how many times have you sinned? How many times have you, have you fallen? How many times have you failed me? Because he has a book where he has everything written down. He just wants you to come and say, Lord, I need you to take my place. I surrender to you tonight. From verse 2 in chapter 8, it continues to say that he is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. And verse 6, chapter 8 and verse 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of the better covenant, which was established on better promises. Another description of what Christ is doing now. So in these verses, we found the following. Christ is taking your place. In the judgment, he's not only taking your place, he's the judge. But the judge who's always willing to do the right thing, to offer you righteousness. Number three, what is he doing right now? He's mediating for you. He's mediating for me. It doesn't matter what you've done tonight, what you've done over the last 20 years or so. The Lord is telling you in this judgment, I'm inviting you not to think about the judgment after the thousand years in heaven, because that judgment is for people that rejected me. Forget about the, the judgment of the great white throne. Think about the judgment that is occurring now. If you accept me now, if you accept me before the second coming, if you accept me before I come, I will take your place. I will judge you with the right hand of righteousness and I will be your mediator. How can you lose a case like that? When the judge is your mediator and the mediator is also the one taking your place saying, step out, I am blameless, I am holy, I never sinned, I will take your place. And there's one last thing that he's doing now. And this one is found in the book or the tiny letter written by John called First John. So go to the right in your Bibles. You will pass by James, first and second Peter, and then you'll get to the letter or the epistle according to John, chapter number two, first John two, from verse one. Perhaps tonight you're asking, Pastor Reynolds, you don't know how many times I've sinned. Julio Gonzalez cannot be compared to me. Right now, before the throne of God, I have way much more than 176 accounts. My lifespan will not be enough to pay for what I've done. Verse 1 in 1 John chapter 2 says the following. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a lawyer, an attorney with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse 2, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 
He's your attorney. He's your advocate. He's your lawyer. Getting to the conclusion of our study tonight, I want you to picture this now in your mind. I want you to picture it. So if you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. Imagine that you are in a courtroom now. And that what is being decided, it's not a traffic violation. It's not a ticket. It's not a, a minor crime. What is being decided right now is where are you going to spend the rest of eternity? Are you going to be consumed quickly by the lake of fire or are you going to live with the Lord forever? You are in that, in that courtroom. And this is what you see. You see the judge. But to the right hand of the judge, there is another judge that is right there working with the main judge, the father. But that judge has the same power. But then you realize that that judge, it's also the mediator. But that same mediator is your lawyer, is the one defending you. But when defending you is not enough, he says, listen up, just say yes to me. Just say yes to me tonight, the last Sunday of June 2020. Do not think about your past. Do not think about what you've done. Because one thing that we do when we are in court before the heavenly throne is that we start thinking about ourselves. And we start seeing our own sins. And we start looking at what we've done. But tonight, Christ is saying, hey, I am your judge, your mediator, your lawyer. And is that if that is not enough, allow me to take your place. And he will stand as the accused now in your place, taking your sins, your violations, the ways you failed, the things you've done. He will take your place. And my question to you tonight is, are you going to reject that? Do you want to face the judgment before the great white throne? Or do you rather face this one? Because that one will be for condemnation. But this judgment is for your salvation. Christ is telling you tonight. Allow me. Just say yes. And I believe in my heart that there's someone. That is not a member of a church perhaps tonight. That has grown cold spiritually. Or that you have been wrestling with your past. The Lord is telling you. Just say yes tonight and I don't know if it's possible for you wherever you may be to type yes in the comment section or just to say yes in your heart tonight to the Lord because you need him you need him to take your place if when Christ comes you are lost it wouldn't be his fault because now that you have the time, he's telling you, I can do everything. And I have the power to do anything I can in order to save you. Christ has provided every possible way to save us. And for us to be declared righteous before the throne of God and in this judgment tonight. Your name is being pronounced in the throne of heaven right now what are you going to say if you wait until he comes in the clouds it will be too late now he's offering you every single solution and he's just asking you to accept it you do not have to be like julio gonzalez there's someone tonight this evening July, June, I mean, 28th, 2020. There's someone that will take your 176 plus accounts and condemnation and free you up tonight. You may be free tonight if you just say yes to what Christ is saying. Tonight, there's salvation in this place. 
You don't have to wait until you go to a physical building that we call church. Tonight, you can find salvation. Tonight, you can say yes to your God. Tonight, you can say yes to freedom. Tonight, you can say yes to be free from guilt and sorrow. You don't have to be Julio Gonzalez. Tonight, you can be redeemed by the high priest called Jesus Christ. That is what he's doing tonight. What else are you waiting for? What else do you want God to do for you? Julio Gonzalez was condemned, but tonight, tonight, you may be given not conditional freedom, not conditional liberty, not probation. Tonight, you may receive perpetual freedom, eternal salvation. I would like to close with a short story. I remember the case of a young man that before accepting Christ as his savior, he committed a crime and he was condemned to prison, but after appealing, he was given probation. After serving and respecting the conditions successfully, the young man accepted Christ as his savior. And after knowing what the Lord had done for him, he wondered if the earthly judicial system could erase his criminal record. So he decided to appeal. In order for his record to be completely eliminated. And it was approved. In a few weeks, he had to present himself before the judge for a hearing. In the meantime, he looked for letters of recommendation from everyone. He asked his pastor, his friends, his family members, his long lost relatives. I think he even asked his enemies to write letters to the judge because he wanted his record to be eliminated. When the day came, he went to court ready to face a judge and with all his letters of recommendation. To his surprise, when he stood before the judge all by himself and without a lawyer, before he could open his mouth or hand any of the letters to the judge, the honorable said, I declare that you're innocent and I order that all your criminal records are eliminated. And this happened in the state of California. It's a true story. The young man was astonished. He couldn't believe it. He didn't have to say a word and the judge not only confirmed his innocence, but also declared that his record was no longer relevant. Out of curiosity, the young man asked a question. He asked the judge, why did you do that without me saying a word or handing out a letter? The judge answered, because I see that you trusted me and my authority. That is what the judge who is your lawyer, who is also your high priest wants to do tonight. When you trust him and honor his authority, he acts on your behalf as he declares you innocent and eliminates your record of 176 plus condemnations. Think about how many times you sinned this week. Reflect on the fact that we have sinned so many times during our lifetime. It is only through the sacrifice of Christ and by what he's doing tonight that you have hope in regards to the judgment. When I think about the sins that I've committed, when you think about your sins, tonight, I need you to stop thinking about yourself and I need you to start thinking about Christ Jesus. My only question to you tonight, the only question I have left is, are you going to reject this wonderful offer? I have noticed that one thing that blocks human beings from accepting it is, as I mentioned before, when they look at themselves. Tonight, your record is going to be eliminated. You don't have to say a word before the throne. Just say yes tonight and Christ will do the rest. And I'm sorry I'm extending for one more minute, but I cannot leave without this statement from one of my favorite writers. Her name is Ellen White. And she says, we are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us. Pay attention to this. We are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us, but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. You are accepted 
The Lord shows that he wants to see Jesus taking your place. He doesn't want to see you because you are imperfect. Christ accepts you when you surrender to him by saying yes. And the Lord accepts Christ on your behalf and his sacrifice on the cross. If I can add a bonus text, go back to Revelation with me. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Once again, the last book of the Bible. From verse 10. And we'll stop at verse 11. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And verse 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. So tonight, Satan is accusing you before the throne saying, no, he did this tremendous thing, even worse than Julio Gonzalez. You cannot eliminate his record. You cannot forgive her tonight. But Christ is saying, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Because my blood is sufficient. And his word saying yes is sufficient to forgive them tonight. That's what the Bible says. What are you going to do? Just say yes. Type it down. Say it to the Lord. Call the pastor. Say yes to that. And you'll be ready for his second coming. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you tonight. Because the judgment that is currently taking place is a judgment of hope. It's a judgment of hope. It's a judgment of joy and salvation. And I am asking, Lord, that one person, just one person that I feel in my heart tonight that has been struggling with their past will say, I have understood tonight what Christ is doing, and I want him to do that for me. I pray for strength for that person, for them to give, or for him or for her to give their life to you. And I pray tonight that salvation would be found by somebody or has been found by somebody tonight. And this will be eternally written down in the book of life. That Mary, John, whatever the name may be, was saved on June 28th. And that his name or her name was defended. Christ took her place. Her sins were forgiven were forgiven and also erased. And tonight, she can leave this meeting, he can leave this service saved by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, it's a very good and very nice uh, presentation. It's a very profound uh, presentation on what Jesus is doing in heaven. He is judging it's uh, nice to know that he is our judge, he is our lawyer, he is our advocate, he is mediating on our behalf. So that's the, the beauty of accepting and knowing about Jesus. We have someone who can defend us in heaven. Now, there is, uh, before we, we close this program, there is a, a question. Since we're talking about judgment, what happened to those people who died without knowing about Jesus, without even have a chance to accept Jesus as their savior? Very good question, Elder Jared. And in their lifespan, perhaps they did not hear about Jesus. And the Bible says, according to Paul, that he cannot condemn, meaning Christ or God cannot condemn someone that didn't have the knowledge. So that person that never had the knowledge cannot be condemned. However, if the person had the knowledge, even before Christ, those things are, um, his sins are taken into account. Because we need to know this, Elder Jared, and that's a key question. The judgment is not being done right now for Christ and God the Father to have information about what you did or what your grandparents did. Because he knows it all. 
So he doesn't need that information because he knows everything. The judgment is being done for the unfallen worlds and also for those evil angels and for seeing himself to see that Christ and God the Father are righteous, they are just, they're firm, and they always want to save. Because we must remember that the condemnation that Satan brought up against the Father in heaven was that he wasn't fair, that he was not a judge God, that he was a dictator. So he's doing the judgment not for his benefit. He's doing the judgment to benefit each one of us, even the people that lived before Christ and his sacrifice or that didn't have the knowledge of Christ. Their names are being considered because Christ and the Father, they know the record of everyone and their names are being considered because before the angelic hosts for them to see that we serve a just God that is seeking justice and righteousness for all. And he considers also if a person heard or if the person did not hear about the Lord. If the person did not hear, then that person cannot be condemned because they didn't have the knowledge. That's what Paul says. But if the person has heard, then the person is going to face the judgment according to what they've heard. And if they rejected Christ, then they have to face the judgment in accordance to their knowledge of the gospel. Yeah, because there are actually school of thoughts that God is unfair, that uh, we are judged, but mm -hmm. those people who are not even following Jesus and even just living a sinful life, they, they have the privilege to be, to be part of God's kingdom where we as his followers, we sacrifice so much and they, they are questioning about where is mercy, where is justice. That's right. What That's right. Think? I think mercy and justice are, have always been portrayed and shown by God, even, and let me use this, even to the lost tribes. There are some wonderful hymns that we sing um, that talk about hope. And there's one hymn that we sing in, in, that is not in our hymnal anymore, but it was in the ancient hymnal that we had that talked about our mansion above the sky. So this was sent by a tribe, by a lost tribe that was found by missionaries before or, or a period of time afterwards. They believed that their home was above the sky. So I certainly believe that God is so merciful, that God is so powerful and also full of grace that I certainly and personally believe that he always looked for ways to manifest to people in different shapes and forms and to offer his mercy. I believe that as Hebrew says, he offers it to the entire world and not only to the believers, he offers his hope and his mercy and his grace to the entire world. But I need to clarify once again that it will not be uh, Christ-like. It will be so unfair if he condemns some, someone that never heard about God, that never knew about Jesus, that never knew about anything related to him, then it will be really unfair for him to say, I'm going to condemn you because you didn't believe in me. So we serve a God that he says, if you never heard about me, I cannot condemn you. So that's how fair he is. But he's unfair. And let me say this also. He's unfair. And please understand what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. He's unfair in the following way. That he doesn't repay us according to our sins. So he is unfair in that aspect in the positive aspect, that if he were to condemn us in, in depending on our sins, then there wouldn't be any hope for us. But he says, mercy and grace is something that you do not deserve. So I'm not repaying you according to what you deserve. I'm repaying you according to my grace and my mercy. Because if we were, if we were supposed to face judgment, deserving each of the things that our sins deserve, there wouldn't be any hope. So tonight, I praise God for mercy and for grace. Thank you very much, Pastor, with your time. And can you close our session with a prayer? Sure thing. Thank you. Father in heaven, thank you for the beauty of your word. And thank you for what Christ is doing for us tonight. The door is still open for somebody to come in and find salvation now that grace is still available for us. I pray, Lord, that this study tonight 
brought hope to someone that was about to give up, for someone that felt condemned by so many people perhaps, but tonight they have found, I hope that they have found freedom and hope in what Jesus Christ is doing for them in heaven. Save us, protect us, and Lord, continue to bless this program as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, just to remind our viewers that each month we will be giving away a free book. Our free book this month is The Great Controversy. And uh, there is certainly uh, much controversy in the world today. So this book describes the history of controversy in our world and the universe. It, it also describes what the future controversy will look like. So I invite you to visit our website, joyoftroy.org, joyoftroy.org to request this free book. And you will also be able to select other items, including a Bible. You may also text your name and address to cell number 518-217-5599, 518-217-5599. Thank you for joining with us. God bless. See you next Sunday.